morning, everybody. Thank you, Susan. And um, thank you, John, for inviting me to be here. John Mintz, the state archaeologist. I'm going to talk about cultural resources management. That's usually a federal um, level term that we use, or a state level term, and s talk about how that's incorporated at the local level. But we'll go through several different iterations of that. Make sure I get this the right way. Um, we're going to touch on cultural resources management and what that means the planning process at the local level, um, the role of the historic preservation planner, and then also opportunities and partnerships to further the common goals of all of our organizations. First though, let me tell you why they may have asked me to come here and talk to you. Um, you will see that I have done just about everything um, in historic preservation, but just a little bit of background. My family roots are from North Carolina. My mom's family started in Western North Carolina in the early 1800s. I'm an Air Force brat. I was raised in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I attended Lewisburg College and Meredith College, so I'm a local college girl. And then I went to the University of Georgia where I got my master's in historic preservation. I did my internship and a temporary position right here in this office. I worked with Catherine Beischer and Michael Southern on the Eastern Guidebook, and that was a fun summer. Um, and then I worked for Preservation North Carolina on their revolving fund. I was the revolving fund assistant. I have also served on a Historic Preservation Commission. I was on the commission in Fayetteville when I lived there, and I was also the chair. And I was the chair when we had an appeal that went to Superior Court. So I've got experience with that as well. Um, I've been a private consultant since 2000, where I've done National Register nominations, National Register districts, design guidelines, and tax credit projects. I also do decorative paint restoration, um, so gilding, stenciling, plaster repair, that type of work. And in 2003, I started out at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I worked for the Department of Defense at Fort Bragg as their architectural historian for six years, and then I moved on to the Navy, and I worked for Commander Navy Region Southeast out of Jacksonville, Florida, where I oversaw the historic buildings component on 22 military installations in seven states. So I worked with seven different SHPOs, um, South Carolina to Texas, in that role. No matter what, 10 years with DOD did not prepare me for work at the local level, I can assure you. Um, I'm most recently working for the town of Wake Forest, where I'm the senior planner for historic preservation. And as a side note, I'm a fledgling banjo player. So that tells you why, why they might have asked me to be here, not the banjo playing, I can assure you. So let's start with what is a cultural resource? Um, this is a term that's thrown around at the federal level. At the local level, cultural resources are sometimes referred to in the performing arts spectrum. Um, but for our purposes, this is what a cultural resource is. It is any de definite location or object of past human activity, occupation, or use, identifiable through inventory, historical documentation, or oral evidence. And we do a lot of that identification, inventory, documentation, and that's where this role comes in. And cultural resources can be divided into archeological buildings, structures, objects, or sites, um, and also landscapes. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about cultural resources. And most of my work is above ground resources. Why does it have to be managed? Well, it doesn't have to be, um, but everybody in this room would like for it to be. Um, and I'd imagine that everybody, anybody who's watching as a planner would also like for it to be. It needs to be managed if you want to maintain tangible evidence of the past um, and also learn about past land uses and settlement patterns. When you're planning a new road, when you're planning to develop a whole site, those past patterns are incredibly important to telling us why we shouldn't grade something, why we shouldn't pave something, and all of the information that we can offer in a cultural resources management standpoint can help planners and engineers plan their communities for the future. To preserve historical information for future generations, we all want our grandchildren to know where we came from and why. Um, cultural resources provide us tangible evidence of that, that future generations can touch, learn from, ask questions about, and, and be inquisitive um, about. So those, those are important to me, anyway. To maintain that character or sense of place, um, when you look at Wake County, um, Apex, Cary, Fuquay, Verena, Wake Forest, Zebulon, Wendell, all of these towns are part of Wake County and they are all completely different. They all have a special sense of place. They all have their own identity. And that's important for us to keep for our small towns, especially with Wake County growing at 100 people a day. Um, that's an incredibly important. 
economic development and tourism. Heritage tourism is the number one reason people get in the car and go somewhere. Um, and if they're coming to your community, you've just gotten to people who might not have come if you didn't have a historic downtown or a historic neighborhood to look at. So that's incredibly important. Also, economic development. If you have an economic development manager um, or director in your town, when a company is looking to come to your town, the first place they drive them through is the historic area. And if you have an active downtown with, pe with shops full, those companies, those are checks in those boxes for those companies to look at coming to your town. So heritage, tourism, economic development are important and part of what we do. So how does cultural resources management happen at the federal level? Well, compliance with federal law. Um, all federal agencies have to be compliant with federal law. All federal agencies, the Department of Defense, the Department of Transportation, um, EPA, energy, everybody has to be compliant with federal law. The idea is, is that the federal government should lead by example, so they are supposed to be compliant. Does it always happen? Not necessarily, but it's supposed to. And so that happens through the National Historic Preservation Act, archeological um, legislation, and NAGPRA, ARPA, among many others. Um, and that happens at the federal level with Advisory Council for Historic Preservation. Now, the Advisory Council has an incredibly small staff to cover the entire country in every federal undertaking that is happening. So they have um, pushed those duties down to the State Historic Preservation Offices. So every federal project comes through the State Historic Preservation Office through the Environmental Review Program and is reviewed. So for example, here in Wake Forest on this map, this blue section here is my historic district. This road, North Main Street, is US 1A. That's a DOT road. It runs right through my historic district. It's in the middle. Um, so anytime DOT has a project planned on North Main Street, it has to be reviewed because not only is it a local historic district, but it's a National Register historic district. And also, you see here, I have a rail line running right through my town, as many of you do in North Carolina. That also has the potential to affect historic districts. So this is an opportunity also for local commissions, because local commissions do have the opportunity to comment on undertakings that are coming through their, their area. For example, the high-speed rail is planned to come through um, Wake Forest, and we had the opportunity to comment on that. Um, it does not mean that the railway is going to listen to us and do what we ask them to do. It does not mean that they're going to preserve the historic district, but it does, it is our only opportunity to make a comment. So if you miss that opportunity, it's a big missed opportunity because this is the only opportunity you have to make a, a potential for change. How does it happen at the state level? Well, cultural resources management happens at the state level through the statewide survey program. Um, and that is a statewide survey program that's been going on for probably 40 years now, um, where the state has been systematically identifying, documenting historic structures, objects, archeological sites throughout the state. Um, if you are a certified local government, you have the opportunity to work through grant funds to get survey done in your community. Maybe your community has been completely surveyed, and that's great. But I'll, just a reminder that's, that the general benchmark for historic is 50 years, and something turns 50 years old every day. So that is an, this is an ongoing process. Um, I mentioned the Certified Local Government Program. If you are not part of that program, see what you can do to become a part of it. Amber Kidd is our CLG coordinator, and she's a great resource to help with who's had work done, where the shortcomings are, helping you plan, and helping you apply for grant funds. Um, you can't, this is a resource that you really need to be a part of. And then one that I've recently become aware of that I want to just pass on is the North Carolina Cemetery Survey. And like I mentioned in Wake County, there is an enormous amount of growth here and our rural communities are really getting go gobbled up at a, at a fast pace. So there are rural cemeteries, family cemeteries, small cemeteries, it may just be one grave, but these are cemeteries within your community that really need to be documented. So if you have a cemetery um, in your community that has not been documented, I strongly encourage you to contact the Office of State Archaeology and get a cemetery survey and record that cemetery so we can map it. Um, and if you have any questions, please contact their office. 
With that being said, I also want to point out that the Historic Preservation Office has a fantastic resource called the HPO Web. Um, and if you can, go on their website and pull up that map. And everything that has been recorded, either for study list, National Register, cemetery, cemeteries that have been recorded as part of a survey, and also um, things that have been determined eligible by the Department of Transportation when they've had their projects are all on that map. And that gives you a list, a starting point of what is eligible or what is historic in your area. How does it happen at the local level? Historic preservation does not happen at the local level without community support. Um, and that means from your board of commissioners or from your neighborhood or your community or just um, a museum or one person, community support is imperative. The number one thing to ask for, is there a historic preservation component in your comprehensive plan? Um, do you have a comprehensive plan? Not everybody does. Um, if you don't have a comprehensive plan and your community is getting ready to work on one, you need to include a historic preservation component because that's the only way people will know that you have historic properties in your town or county or, or city. Um, if you haven't had a survey done, but there's one study list property in your community within your town limits, that is your historic preservation component, that one property. So make sure that you include that in there so that the other planners know to avoid it or to incorporate it into future planning efforts. If it's not part of your comprehensive plan, is it part of your community plan? Um, your community plan is going to talk about the goals of the community and where they hope to be in the next five to ten years. Um, usually, we'll have a, have a conversation about the special character areas in the, in the town or county, and that is where you go for your historic property information, and you take that and build on it for your comprehensive plan. Is historic preservation and special character a priority in your community? Not every community has that priority. Um, I have certainly been in those communities. And that is a community choice. Um, so if you don't have local support and there is not historic preservation, it's a really hard place to start. And um, we all understand that. But folks who are other commissions, the State Historic Preservation Office, the Office of State Archaeology are your partners and can help you work on that. I'm lucky that it is important to Wake Forest, and, um, and they have made it a priority. So that is something that I work on every day. Another thing for planning, um, if, you're in a, if you are a planner um, in a municipality, is internal communication. If you're not talking with your colleagues, then they don't know. Um, and that's just the reality of the situation. You need all of these folks so that you can do your job properly. Um, and if you're not having those conversations with them, you need to start. It's not easy, I understand. Not everybody has the same goal, and that's just the way it is. But we're all trying to do our jobs. And if you want to do your job um, well, starting with them is a good way to start. The planning and engineering department, this is where all the plans are coming in. These are all the changes in the town. The engineering department is doing streetscape improvements, transportation planning, replacing sidewalks, doing soil erosion and um, um, water runoff projects, all of this stuff that you need to be aware of. So you need to be talking to them. The inspections department and the public works department, you need your inspections department. Are they filing demolition permits and not contacting you to um, see if it's a historic building? Um, that's important to know. You need to work with them on that. Have they, do they um, go out and inspect for um, minimum housing standards? Is it, are they inspecting in your historic district? It would be good if you knew that um, so that you could work with them to try to find solutions to those problems. You may not find one, and that's okay, but if you don't try, then for sure you're not gonna find one. Um, the um, facilities department, these are the folks who are taking care of town facilities. Does your town have historic properties? and historic buildings in it? Do you work with your facilities department to find out you know, what the five-year budget looks like for maintenance? Those kinds of things are questions you can ask. Um, and it's a lot of times, it's, they're hard conversations, but we need to have them. Um, parks and recreation also. Uh, the parks are public land. Um, if, do you have an ordinance that prohibits digging in the parks? That is an important thing to think about. Most of us don't. Um, should we? Maybe. Um, that's something we need to look at. 
and communications department. I could not do my job without our communications department. They are phenomenal. Um, from helping me do graphic design and brochures and get flyers out and newsletters and press releases and all of that, they are your best friends, especially when it comes to social media and getting information out. And then lastly, the attorney's office. I'm not an attorney. I don't even play one on TV. Um, this is something that you need to have a really good relationship with your attorney's office. You know, if you're proposing new ordinances or if you're going to just put in a stop work order on a project, can you do that? For how long? What can you, you know, what are your, what's your backup plan? And your attorney's office will help you with that. I have mine on speed dial. So. Again, at the local level, cultural resource management happens at the local planning office, number one. Um, we have all the plans that come in from the town in Wake Forest, we're lucky. Not only do we have a historic preservation ordinance, we have a demolition of historic structures ordinance, which was passed with special um, legislation from the general, um, in, under general statute in 2008. So any project that requires demolition of something, I have to review, so when a big, piece of land is sold and somebody wants to develop it as a subdivision, I get pulled into those conversations to see if there are historic structures on that site that require consideration before they can be demolished. And so that's something special. So look at your ordinances and see where you should be inserted into the process. Um, you probably won't be in all of it, but you may be in more conversations than you realize. If you're a Main Street community, um, Wake Forest is a Main Street community, and we have a Main Street coordinator and downtown development director who is separate from me. Um, and she and I work very closely together on the Main Street and um, staying within the guidelines of the Main Street community um, requirements and preserving our historic downtown. And she does a great job. So um, it's always fun when we get to team up on things. Local nonprofits. Um, we're lucky in Wake County, we have Capital Area Preservation as a, as a local nonprofit for our county, and they do a fantastic job of supporting all of us if we need help or just offering guidance. Um, some of you are also fortunate to have, for example, the Preservation Society of Asheville Buncombe County, or Historic Wilmington, or Historic Salisbury. All of these organizations are our backups and our partners. Um, and if you have one in your community or nearby, maybe even just in your county, how helpful would that be to become very good friends with them and start doing some cross-programming? The bottom line is private individuals. Um, at the local level, um, at the federal level, we're lucky because the federal government's supposed to do this, so we can kind of make them. At the local level, it's more of a voluntary thing. People buy these properties and they put their hard-earned money and time and love and blood and sweat and tears into these properties to be stewards of them. So we really need to work closely with them. And um, a lot of times, we're not their favorite person because we're telling them they can't do something they want to do to their property. But if you can see past that and realize that everybody is trying to do what they want to do, um, and it's very helpful to work with the private individuals who are stewards of your properties. Um, I always like to say that um, I realize that this person doesn't have the same goal as I, but we're both just trying to do our job and try to do a good job. So if you can remember that when you're working with these folks, it may help you um, bridge that gap and find some compromise. The role of the Historic Preservation Planner is compliance. We have an ordinance, we're trying to uphold it. So at the end of the day, it is a compliance job. Um, it's like an inspector. You have to be an advocate. Um, the buildings, sites, structure, objects, they don't have a voice. You are their voice. They can't speak for themselves. They can't fight for themselves. You have to fight for them. That is your job. You're the advocate for historic properties. Um, and you have to be a partner. You have to be able to partner with a bunch of groups and think outside the box to try to make things happen. Um, some days are better than others. Trust me, I don't live in a perfect world either, um, but we all have to figure out a way to make this work. And again, public education and awareness is key. So I'll tell you about a few things that I've done since I've been at Wake Forest, and you may be able to incorporate them, and it may give you some ideas to jump off of. Now, I fully understand that some of you who are historic preservation planners, 
you don't have time to do anything but review certificate of appropriateness applications because you have so many coming in and there's so much development in your area. Raleigh, Charlotte, Winston-Salem, Greensboro, these are, reviewing COAs is a full-time job. But for others of you, and even those folks who are bogged down in the process, there are some ideas that you might be able to pull into your program. One thing I started doing about two years ago was I started doing walking tours of our historic district. Our local historic district is nice and compact. Has a, I can talk about the whole history of the town by walking up the street. And we do this um, in the fall and the spring. And we re, it's confined to 12 registrants per tour, and they've all been full. Um, and we just advertised the ones for the spring. I'm offering eight tours this spring. And the um, first one is full, and another one in May is already full. And it's been a huge hit. And I will tell you that of the people who come to my tours, it's all people who have just moved to Wake County, and they don't know anything about Wake Forest. So this is a great audience for me, for them to learn about the history of the community, learn why it's important, and walk around it and enjoy it um, as a tourist. And so when they see a project coming in, on Main Street, they may want to know what's happening because that, if they, that may now be a concern to them. And so that's important. In addition to offering to the public, my administration allowed me to offer it to staff. Um, so I've had staff, um, my colleagues, come on the tour as well. And that's been great because now they know where my area of focus is and where my concerns may lay. So if it's the transportation planner or the communications director or the facilities director, they now have a better understanding of why I'm so passionate about what I do and about historic preservation. If you don't have time to take people on walking tours, which I fully understand, maybe you can create a brochure that you can put out in a little information box in your historic district, and people can pick up and walk and do a walking tour on their own. Or better yet, talk with your GIS folks and see if they can create a virtual tour for you. We have incorporated all of these things um, within our town, and they've been really successful. And we're still working on a couple of them. But, um, but having that multi-layer advocacy is a good way to do it. This started way before me. Um, we have a biennial tour of historic homes in Wake Forest. It started in the 80s, and it's operated by the Historic Preservation Commission and the Wake Forest Women's Club. Hugely successful, and um, it is now part of my job duties, and it takes about three months of my time. Um, so it's a big deal, um, but the community loves it, and it's something that I don't see us stopping. So um, we have 10 to 15 historic properties open. They're usually privately owned homes. Um, we do have churches and downtown lofts um, in, the historic in the downtown district. We sell over 2,000 tickets every time. And it's a fundraiser for the Historic Preservation Commission and the Women's Club. And um, again, hugely successful. We started shuttle service last year. Um, and we'll have to add a bus this year. So it keeps growing. Um, what the Historic Preservation Commission did with some of their money, which is really interesting this year, is the historic tree canopy is part of our historic district and adds to the character of that district. Well, that canopy is aging, and trees are living things, and eventually we'll, we will lose them. So we partnered with our urban forestry coordinator with the town so that we could identify trees that needed to be removed, trees that needed to be pruned, and where we could replant. And the Historic Preservation Commission used some of their proceeds to go towards that program. And now that's going to be an ongoing program that we do annually so that we can maintain the tree canopy um, in the historic district. If you don't have time to do a tour, maybe somebody else is doing one. Um, our cemetery advisory board, the town of Wake Forest owns a cemetery that it operates through the Public Works Department, and they have an advisory board, and that board operates a tour of the cemetery every May, and it's hugely successful also. And what better way to learn about the lives that shaped your community than to tour the historic town cemetery? And they do a great job. And I don't do anything. That's all on the Cemetery Advisory Board and the Public Works Commission. I, I do publicize it through my, my means. But other than that, it's all done on its own. And um, that may be something if you've got a volunteer who's interested in doing stuff like that, who has an education background or a nonprofit background, you may have a volunteer you could tag to start something like that, and you have very little to do with it, so it doesn't take away from your time on the, at the office. 
joint programming is incredibly important to me. Um, I've always, throughout my career, worked with in partnership with other people. And I always say, I don't care whose idea it is, as long as it gets done, it doesn't matter to me. So if you've got an idea, run with it. Um, sort of this, again, I'm gonna preach on the Certified Local Government Program. We, I can't say enough about that. That is our only avenue, really, for this type of funding and this type of partnership. So if you're not active in it, you really should be. And that's something you should work on. Um, we did, last year, we got a very small grant to host two property owner workshops. The first one, they were both on a Thursday night, consecutive Thursday nights. Um, the first one, Jeff Adolphson came and spoke about, he's a restoration specialist with the Historic Preservation Office. He came and spoke about the Secretary of Interior Standards, appropriate methods of um, material replacement, and the tax credit program. And then the next Thursday night, we had David Maurer, who's a local architect here in Raleigh, come and talk to him about the tax credits, the Secretary of Interior Standards, and the building code. And we had about 25 property owners come out, but I sent the notice out to all of the National Register property owners, and then I partnered with our downtown development director, and she sent the notice out to her Wake Forest downtown, which is a nonprofit, and also to all her downtown property owners, so that we could get the most coverage. And that was really a great way for us to cross Promoted, and we had a good turnout, and it was a very um, active discussion. So, which I always, if I've only got five people in the room, if they're talking about it, then it's a success. And then one of my favorite days last year um, was when we partnered with the Office of State Archaeology. We received a CLG grant for this project. The town of Wake Forest owns a historically African-American resource. It's a house and a site um, that was, we believe was built during Reconstruction. And um, the town is working to rehabilitate the house. But my goal um, since I've been there has been to get as much information out of that site as we can to tell the story of African-American life in Wake Forest from reconstruction to the current day. Um, so it's been really important that we get what we can from it. Um, so we've, we partnered with the Office of State Archaeology and um, applied for a grant to do ground penetrating radar of the site. And we hired a consultant to come and um, they did the ground penetrating radar and got their data. And then we did a Saturday workshop and we had three separate sessions. We started in the classroom and I talked about the history of the house, the architecture, what it can tell us, um, staff from OSA talked about the artifact collection and what they were able to glean from the artifacts to tell us about this family. And then the archaeological firm who did the ground penetrating radar talked about their results there. And then we took the participants out on the site and allowed them to do an actual GPR demonstration and to look at the house, walk around the house, ask questions. And um, we partnered with OSA, New South and Associates who did the archaeology for us and also the Young family, the descendants of Ailey Young were present and participated in the workshop and it was just a really good day all the way around. It was, um, it was hot, but it was a good day. And we had about 60 people come, um, which I thought was a really good turnout for a Saturday. So a few other ideas, Owner Appreciation Day. Um, we did something like this um, last year and we invited all of our historic property owners to come um, for just kind of a social event. And they really had a good time and enjoyed each other's company. And it was fun. They weren't there for a meeting. They weren't there for a workshop or anything. It was just to have a good time. And that was really a positive thing for our, for our historic district. So that's something we'll do again. A lecture series. Um, I don't have a lecture series at Wake Forest, and um, I don't have plans to start one, but that is something that a lot of people do. And I know up in Franklin County, um, in Lewisburg, they do a lecture series up there at Lewisburg College about the history of the area. That's something that you can partner with your historical museum or your preservation nonprofit to execute. And it just raises public awareness and, and education. Um, in Wake Forest, I'm fortunate that we had the Wake Forest Historical Museum, and and um, they do that type of programming all the time and are doing a great job at it. So I'm not going to get myself involved in their success, um, but I do promote it because it is positive for me as well. Hands-on workshops. You could apply for CLG grants to do hands-on workshops for window repair, window replacement, slate roof repair, how to repair wood siding, how to um, make your house more energy efficient. All of these things are ideas that raise awareness and also provide an educational component. 
haunted tours. That's something that's been tossed around with us because we have historic hauntings. Um, and that's something that some communities do do, and it's really a, a big time. Uh, there, I've never heard of one failing because they're so much fun, but that's something that you could do. And publications are another way. If you can't afford to hire somebody to write a manuscript and publish a book, because they can be expensive, can you just do a little brochure that can be um, laid out and printed through your communications department? That's something that you can put out at the local museum or local restaurants and shops um, just to tell the story. Musical series. Um, I love music, so if there's a way for me to incorporate music into it, I think it's a great idea. Um, maybe you do uh, Sunday concerts at historic properties and you have a ramble, you know, where people ramble from house to house and listen to music at the same time. There's all different ways of incorporating this into your plan to raise community awareness. And then oral history and virtual tours. Um, I'm currently working on a project not incredibly um, timely, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an ongoing project. But we have um, our historically African-American neighborhood is, um, it's, we're losing parts of it on a regular basis. And unfortunately, it doesn't fit in the box for National Register um, eligibility. So I've been trying to figure out ways of how we can document these properties to tell the story for future generations so that if we lose more of that neighborhood, we have something to pass on um, that tells the story of, our, of the East End. And so one of the things we did last year, I had a summer intern and she was great. And we met with a couple of the older residents of the neighborhood, we spent the day with them. And they told us their stories of childhood and growing up in the neighborhood. And then I said, do you mind getting in the car with me? And so we got them in the car and we rode around the neighborhood and they just told us where everything used to be. That's where the general store used to be. That's where the candy shop was. That's where the community pool was. And they pointed all these things out to us and we mapped it. And so now we're taking that map, which is a hard copy, and we're gonna incorporate it into our GIS layers and then also try to continue to receive information such as documentary photographs, more oral history stories that we can add to those layers and come up with what I call, what I've coined, a virtual historic district. Um, so that, since we don't really have one on the ground. And that's kind of a la cultural landscape approach, um, but it's really, we do have some neighborhoods that have been, mar you know, that are marginalized that really don't fit into those neat little boxes that the National Register has for us. So this provides us with an opportunity to share those stories as well. So in summary, it's pretty much what you're already doing. So I haven't added, I'm sure I haven't added too much new information to what you do on a daily um, basis. But as the historic preservation planner, you have to be part of the process. And if you're not, you have to figure out how to, how to fix that. Um, that's the number one um, thing. You have to be an advocate for the properties. Remember, they can't speak for themselves. That's why you're there. And as the historic preservation planner, that's your sole interest. You don't really have any other interests other than the preservation of the historic district. So you really are that person. And then partner, partner, partner. Um, there's partnerships all around you, you probably haven't even noticed. Um, and just, you know, like I said, if you don't have time to deal with it, see if somebody else will take it on. Um, get a volunteer. Um, I have great volunteers in Wake Forest who do that type of stuff. And at the end of the day, all any of us can do is the best we can. So if you're doing that, then you're already doing a good job. So, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Um, the question was, uh, how often is archaeology talked about in the, in the city or town's comprehensive plan? And the answer to that is not, a, not enough. Um, it is not really talked about in the comprehensive plan. Uh, it's something that 
unfortunately, under general statute, we can't require private property owners to incorporate that. Um, we can incorporate it into the public lands policy, um, and that's something that I would like to do. I know it's been done in a few counties. Um, at least one county has incorporated archaeology into their planning. Um, but that's something that I would like to do for our public plan. And if there is a way for us to incorporate it um, fully, then I think we should. In Wake Forest, our historic district design guidelines has an archaeology section, but it's mostly for guidance. Unfortunately, we really don't have any um, teeth to, to make the property owner do it. Um, John asked um, if any of the sites in our historic East End area that have been identified by our local residents have been developed, um, or could they would they be a good subject for archaeological um, discovery? And they probably would be good subject for archaeological discovery. Again, they're privately owned, so it would have to we'd have to work with the private property owners to see if if they would be willing to do that. Any other questions? Absolutely. Yeah. I think um, with some more study, I think it would. I think at this point, the information is that we don't have enough information to determine how many layers have we gone through. Um, several of them have already been redeveloped, but they've been redeveloped 20, 30 years ago. So it would take the research on those specific sites to determine what's left, how much of it has been disturbed, and if there's good reason to, to try to do something archeological there. And I'm certainly open to looking at that. Um, but like I said, this is, it's not, this is kind of one of those projects that I'm doing in my spare time. It's not a, it's not a full, full on project, although it would be a great one. Yes, sir. Sure. Um, and I'm, like I said, I do mostly historic preservation, so I'm not a subdivision planner or, um, or somebody who works with that daily, but I can speak a little bit to this just from recent experience. Um, the planning process, when the plans come through for, at least in Wake Forest, when the plans come through uh, for a new subdivision, let's say, we go through what we call a technical review committee, which is reviewed by DOT, um, our public works, our fire department, the planners for all the compliance requirements and everything, and we make comments at that time, at that early, before they've pulled any um, put in any applications or anything like that to tell them what they're probably gonna have to change or what's not gonna work. Um, and then once it gets through that process, um, we get what we call a subdivision review plan, um, and that comes through the planning office to review. Um, once they start construction, that's a whole nother set of permitting that goes through planning as well as inspections. Um, and we do have, we have construction inspectors who inspect the job site daily. Um, or weekly, depending on what's needed, what level of work is being done. And if they see an issue or a problem, they stop the work and we work it from there to remedy it. Um, if we have something, we've had a recent case where we had to stop work on a site um, because they disturbed a sensitive area that wasn't supposed to be disturbed. And we did stop the work on that site until we could remedy the situation, which was a couple of weeks, and, um, and then put in restrictions for the continued construction. So um, that, in every town, I think, works a little bit differently, um, but that's ha kind of how we work. And if they are in violation of a specific permit, some permits come with fines and some don't. Um, so it just depends on the permit that they're in violation of. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anything else? 
Thank you so much. Thank you.